Uh, let's talk about gravity for just a little bit. So this is the first major force we'll encounter. And again, it's a non-contact force. Two objects do not have to be in contact for gravity to operate on them. So it, we set up a gravitational field, we say. And for two objects to feel gravity, what do both objects need to have? Yes. Mass. So it turns out So the force is proportional to the mass of both objects. It's inversely proportional to the distance of separation squared between them. So in this case, we have a proportionality constant. We just call the gravitational constant. It's on your hand out there. And it just makes it so that these are equal. Without this, they wouldn't be equal. They'd be related directly. So this wouldn't be equal. So it's the proportionality constant. Uh, in this case, if I magically could flip a switch and double the mass of, say, the Earth, how would I feel as far as you know, the force of gravity? So I double, because the force is proportional to the mass of either object. So if instead of doubling the Earth, I could magically just double my mass, which is, seems a little easier. Uh, might take a couple months, but I think I could pull it off. So what would be the effect on the force of gravity I would feel? Double as well. So in this case, how far am I from the Earth? What is my distance of separation? What's that? Well, yeah, you got to go all the way to the center of the Earth here. That distance of separation is all the way to the center of the Earth. So in this case, we can't just say I'm touching the Earth and that the distance is zero, because then what kind of force would I feel? It'd be infinite, yes. So in this case, we actually have to look at the entire radius of the Earth. That's how far I am from the center of the Earth. Whatever that is, and typically on the inside cover of any physics textbook, you can find that or you can Google it if needed, um, but that's what I'd use for the radius. So in this case, if I could start flying into outer space, because I can do that, you know, uh, and if I could get to a distance where I was twice as far away, so my altitude here was equal to the radius of the Earth. So now total, I am two radiuses of the Earth farther away. What would that do to the force of the gravity I would experience? Half fourth. You say half, you say fourth. So how is F related to the distance separation here? We'd say it's proportional not to one over R, but to one over R squared. So in this case, if I double the radius, force is only gonna be one fourth as much. Great. Any questions on this? So a quirk of nature, we'll find out that when we get to electro, uh, electromagnetic forces, electrostatics, Coulomb's law looks eerily just like this, except with charges, but still related to one over the distance squared. Are we supposed to know the, the radius? Of the Earth? Yeah. No. Don't bother memorizing the radius of Earth at all. If you need it, they will totally give it to you no problem. <laughs> so, question number one on your handout here says, if a planet has half the mass and half the radius of the Earth, how does the acceleration due to gravity on, uh, on the surface of this planet compare to that on the surface of the Earth? So first of all, it has half the mass of the Earth. How is the force of gravity going to be related to the mass of the Earth? Yeah, so in this case, force is going to be directly proportional to the mass of the Earth. So if I cut the mass of the Earth in half, I'm going to cut that force in half as well. Okay, and then force, like we already said, is proportional to one over the distance of separation squared, in this case, the radius. So what did I do the radius? It's only half as well. So in this case, how's that gonna affect the force? Yeah, it's gonna quadruple the force. So if that's only half as much, so one half squared, so one over one half squared rather is four times greater. So in this case, because the mass is half, it's half as big, but because the radius is half as big, it's four times greater, and so overall, yeah, the force of gravity is going to be double on the surface of that planet compared to Earth. So what is the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth? 9.8 meters per second squared. What would it be on the surface of this planet? 19.6 meters per second squared. Great. All right, next force we got to talk about is called the normal force. And unlike gravity, normal force is actually a contact force. So in this context, can anybody tell me what it means to be normal? And I know you guys, none of you are really experts on normal, but can you tell me what it means to be normal in a physics context? Perpendicular. So when we talk about the normal, we just mean perpendicular to a surface in this case. And so in this case, normal force is the perpendicular component so of a force where two objects are in contact. 
<clears throat> and the reason that's important is that now we're going to talk about friction. So if I were to take and steal Chris's phone here for a minute for the purpose of a demonstration, and if I slide it along the table, so why might it not slide off the edge of the table if I get it going here? Friction. So in this case, friction did indeed stop it before it went off the edge. Probably a good thing, because I don't want to buy you a new phone. So in this case, so why does it have friction? Why does it have friction? So how could I give it more friction? So not necessarily. So think about it this way. So if I slide my hand across the table, no big deal. But if I push down while I'm sliding it, how does that affect my friction? It's greater. So in this case, it's not so much that I care about me pushing down on the table, but Newton's third law. I'm pushing down on the table, but the table is pushing back up on me. And we call that force, the table's pushing back up on me, the normal force. And so in this case, it turns out your frictional force is proportional to the normal force. So something with greater mass or having a greater downward force applied to it, it's going to have a greater normal force pushing back. And so in this case, it turns out your frictional force takes on one of a couple of different forms. So, and depending on your textbook, I'm gonna call it FN. A lot of textbooks will give this the letter, capital letter N, or some funky Greek letter N. I'm just gonna call it F sub N for normal force here. So, forces are vectors, as the case may be. And this mu right here takes on one of two different forms. We have mu static, and we have mu kinetic. So it turns out, if the object is not moving, it turns out it's going to take a little bit more force to overcome the friction to get it moving. Then once you've got it moving, maintaining it is actually easier. So it turns out you get some little spot welds forming between the two surfaces. And so to get it moving takes a little more force than just to keep it moving once it's going. And so we have two different coefficients of friction. One that applies if the object and the surface are not slipping over each other. And one that applies if they are slipping across each other. Cool. Ooh, and if you notice, I indicated that in your handout. So, and it's this guy right here. What did I actually put? I didn't put FF. I put FF maximum. So, which implies that it's, this is the biggest it could be, but it might not necessarily be this big. We'll talk about why that might be here. Actually, let's talk about that in a sec. So, let's say I start pushing on Chris's phone here again across the table, and I push on it, it doesn't move and I push on it, it doesn't move. We can infer that the force of friction is perfectly countering the force I push with. So, however, at some point, I'm gonna push harder and harder and harder, and at some point, it will move. I will overcome this friction. And so, all along the way, this force of friction was increasing, but once it barely starts to move, that's when I know I've achieved the maximum. I've just gotten over it at that point. And so, you can't actually say that your force of static friction is actually equal to this equation unless you know you're at that point of maximum. Cool. We'll have a question on that here shortly.